In this video, we are going to be covering the topics in chapter 13, which has to do with carbohydrates. Carbohydrates are a major source of energy in our diets. We can find them in products like potatoes, bread, and even pasta. Understand that carbohydrates um, derive their name because their general chemical formula is CNH2ON. So that's why they are hydrates of carbon. That's where the, uh, the name is derived from. They are made by the elements carbon, hydrogen, and oxygen. Understand that plants utilize CO2, water, and energy. Through the process of photosynthesis, they can synthesize carbohydrates. We need to obtain them from the diet. And when we obtain them through eating, understand that carbohydrates go through the process of respiration. And in respiration, we turn carbohydrates, so for example, glucose, into CO2, water, and energy. So when we are doing the process of respiration, In other words, if you look at what are the components in a carbohydrate and what are the products of their reaction, it means that every time we are undergoing the process of respiration, we are combusting carbohydrates. Because remember that in the process of respiration, we're taking a molecule that has carbon, hydrogen, and oxygen, we are reacting it with oxygen, and then we're turning it into CO2, water, and energy. Carbohydrates are also called saccharides, and saccharides means sugar. There are different types of carbohydrates. The basic unit of a carbohydrate is going to be called a monosaccharide, and those are the simplest carbohydrates. If we take two units of monosaccharides and we link them together, that is called a disaccharide. And then when we put many, 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 many monosaccharides together, then those are known as polysaccharides. Understand that carbohydrates can be hydrolyzed, but only if they are disaccharides or polysaccharides. Monosaccharides cannot undergo hydrolysis because they are already the simplest carbohydrate out there. But if we have a disaccharide, again, di means two, so when it is hydrolyzed, when do we break them apart? Then we can have two monosaccharides. If we have a polysaccharide and we hydrolyze them, meaning hydrolysis is cutting with water. That's why we have it here. If we are hydrolyzing a polysaccharides, we're going to obtain many monosaccharide molecules. Understand that in order to hydrolysis to happen, we either need acid, but remember that in the first one, hydrolysis is not going to be occurring. So hydrolysis only happens where we have the check, mark, the check marks, or we could do it through an enzyme. And we're going to be talking about enzymes later in the semester. Let's start focusing now on monosaccharides. When it comes to monosaccharides, understand that they consist of three to eight carbon chains with one carbon that contains a carbonyl group. If your monosaccharide contains an aldehyde, then that means that we call it an aldose. If your monosaccharides contain a ketone group, 
that means that we consider it a ketose. And as you can see here, we have the examples on the right for the structures of erythrose and erythrolose. As you can see, an erythrose is going to be an aldose because it contains an aldehyde, while erythrolose is a ketose because it has a carbon that is bonded to a carbonyl, and that carbonyl is bonded to another carbon. We can also categorize monosaccharides as, uh, or they can be classified by the number of carbons that are present in the molecule. So, as you can see, remember that monosaccharides have anywhere between three to eight. carbon atoms. So if our monosaccharide has three carbons, we call it a triose. If it has four carbons, we call it a tetrose. If, we have, if it has five carbons, we call it a pentose. If it has six carbons, we call it a hexose. For seven carbons will be a heptose, eight carbons, will be an octose. Now, we can incorporate the aldehyde and ketone classification along with the number of carbons in order to classify monosaccharides. So for example, if we look at the molecule of glucose, because glucose contains an aldehyde, then we can classify it as an aldose hexose, but the final word, is going to be aldo. So the way that we do classification taking into account carbonyl and number of carbons if we have an aldehyde then we're going to write the word aldo. If we have a ketone, then we're going to write the word keto. And then we're going to write the word for the number of carbon, meaning triose, tetrose, pentose, hexose, heptose, octose. So that's why we see that in the case of glucose, that is called an aldohexose because it contains an aldehyde, which I highlighted in orange. And if we look at the number of carbons in the molecule, there are one, two, three, four, five, six. If we look at, for example, fructose, fructose is categorized at a, as a ketohexose because it has a ketone, C double bond O, bonded to carbon, bonded to carbon. And when we highlight the atoms in terms of the number of carbons, we have one, two, three, four, five, six. Let's do the classifications of the following monosaccharides. So as you can see here, we have in the first part of our worksheet, the classification of carbohydrates. In other words, these monosaccharides in terms of their number of carbons and the presence of um, uh, an aldehyde or a ketone. So in the ones that we have present, here, which is just a selected number from the worksheet, you guys can see that each one of them have an aldehyde. We have a C double bond O, H. So that means that the first word in our classification is going to be aldo. Then we look at the number of carbons in each of the molecules. Glyceraldehyde has one, two, three carbons, so that's an aldotriose. Erythrose has one, two, three, four carbons, so that's an aldotetrose. Arabinose has one, two, three, four, five carbons, so it is considered an aldo 
pentos. The next topic that we're going to be covering in chapter 13 is isomers. So we previously already learned about isomers in chapter 11. Remember that we were introduced to the concept of constitutional isomers. So as a review, the definition of a constitutional isomer is molecules with the same molecular formula but different attachment of atoms. Now we are going to explore a new type of isomer and these are going to be stereoisomers. Stereoisomers are also spatial isomers because you guys will see that these are going to be molecules that are different in terms of space. So this is just a little bit of one more level of complexity when it comes to isomers. We are going to be mostly exploring enantiomers, but understand that stereoisomers also have another classification that they are diastereomers. And diastereomers specifically are going to be um, where we have cis and trans isomers classified as. So remember, structural isomers are going to be the same thing as constitutional isomers. And as I defined them in the previous slides, these are going to be molecules that have the same molecular formula, but different bonding arrangements. So as you can see here, now we have new, uh, some of the functional groups that were discussed in chapter 12. And now we are defining how they can be constitutional isomers of each other. So understand that an alcohol and an ether of the same molecular formula are going to be structural isomers of each other or constitutional isomers. Aldehydes and ketones of the same molecular formula can be structural isomers of each other. But now let's dive in into what is a stereoisomer. So in order to have a stereoisomer, understand that we're going to have molecules that have identical molecular formulas, okay? They are not structural isomers because the atoms are going to be bonded in the same sequence. It's just that they are going to be different from one each other in terms of how they are arranged in space. So understand that whenever we're doing these, we're going to be comparing two molecules to each other. These molecules, in order to be stereoisomers, can, um, cannot be superimposable. That means that you cannot stack them on top of each other. And they are known to be chiral. And we're going to talk about chirality in the upcoming chapters. So understand that in problem two in the worksheet, we need to determine if a particular compound is either identical an enantiomer or a constitutional isomer, okay? Remember that the definition of these are going to be specifically if we have a molecule that cannot be superimposed or that, that is non-superimposable, but they're mirror images of each other, that's what an enantiomer is, okay? And we're going to continue uh, talking about this. So let's look at the following pairs of molecules. In the first set, we are comparing an alkene to a cyclohexane. Both of them contain one, two, three, four, five carbon atoms. So you can see in the alkene we have one, two. In the alkene we have five. In the cycloalkene we also have one, two, three, four, five. We already learned that alkenes and cyclic alkanes are going to have the same chemical formula, that it is 
CnH2n. So understand that 2-pentene and cyclopentane are constitutional isomers of each other. If we look at the second pair of the molecule, we can see that they're both methylcyclobutane. So these two molecules are identical. Now, the last pair of molecules, if we draw a dotted line representing a mirror plane, you can see that the right side of the molecule matches the left side of the second molecule. They are mirror images of each other. If we take the second molecule and we place it on top of the next one, because they are non-superimposable and they're chiral, these two molecules are going to be enantiomers. of each other.